April, uh, Wednesday, May 13th, really nice day of hopefully a good sign, spring and better things are coming. Um, today's really a highly anticipated conference. I just wanted to give um, some additional good news. You know, we have a monthly visiting professor. This month was supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation, Dr. Fuster and Dr. Eugene Bornwald, which would have been a highlight of the academic year. Um, and we're in the midst of you know, rescheduling that. We're also very delighted to announce that uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who many of you have heard, read, uh, who had been a medical resident here. Um, I was his attending in the CCU. Um, then went on to much greater and um, better things. He was uh, head of the FDA under Trump left. Had come here as a visiting professor and by popular demand is coming back in December as visiting professor. We're still working on the rest of the lineup. I certainly hope um, that by September, uh, we'll be able to have uh, that program completely intact. Um, so let me just announce uh, uh, the people from today's program. We had a few weeks ago, uh, Justino gave a really wonderful summary of the ischemia trial, which was a landmark trial in New England Journal. And then he very carefully helped dissect it down with the help of the panel, which included Greg Stone. Greg Stone is Director of Academic Affairs for Mount Sinai Harm, Professor of Cardiology and Population Health Sciences and Policy at the Icon School of Medicine. Uh, we were uh, really uh, thrilled to be able to recruit him where he had been at Columbia. He's been a principal investigator for more than 80 national, international, multi-center trials. He, along with Dr. Marty Leon, who was supposed to be our visiting professor in June, soon to be postponed as well, uh, are the directors of the Trans Therapeutic, the world's largest symposium devoted interventional cardiology. Um, Dr. Stone will be the moderator. The panelists will include Dr. Valentin Fuster, who's the physician in chief and director of Mount Sinai Heart, the Zena and Michael Wiener Cardiovascular Institute, the Kravis Center for Cardiovascular Health, uh, the Sakra Center, the Richard Gorlin uh, MD Heart Research Foundation professor. He's also the president of science and the general director of Centro Nacional Investigaciones. Cardiovasculares, Carlos III um, in Madrid, which is essentially their NIH. Um, in 2012, was named the a legend, a living legend in cardiovascular medicine. Um, I think he and Dr. Braunwald are the only two. Uh, the Research Achievement Award for the American Heart Association. Of course, he's the editor in chief of Jack, the mother journal of all Jack journals, and of Hearst. Um, Dr. Stone Thomas, Director of Clinical Cardiology, Dean of International Clinical Affiliation, um, his laboratory with Dr. Kinney has performed the most PCIs in year while achieving the highest safety level year after year after year. Oksana Moran is a, a Chair Professor and Director of the International Cardiovascular Research and Clinical Trials at Mount Sinai. And obviously also internationally recognized for her work, uh, clinical trial specialist, com uh, complex data analysis, and a woman in interventional cardiology, uh, recently uh, published a seminal Twilight article that I'm hoping she will lead as a journal club next week, uh, soon to be discussed in more detail. Dr. Dengus has been awarded in 2019, the Distinguished Fellowship Award by the American College of Cardiology is Director of Academic Affairs for the CRC and Co-Director of the TCT. He's Professor of Cardiology and Medicine here at Sinai. Dr. Robin Vergesi is Associate Professor of Medicine in Department of Cardiovascular Surgery. He completed Medicine and Residency in Cardiac Surgery at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. But what I didn't know is he did training in critical care, and he is the uh, Mount Sinai System Director of Cardiovascular Critical Care. Thank you, Robin. He also completed a master's in clinical epidemiology at Stanford University in California. Dr. Narula is professor of medicine 
and Philip and Harriet Goodhart Chair in Cardiology. They, um, he is Director of Cardiology at Mount Sinai Morningside, is Associate Dean of Global Health, uh, was former Editor-in-Chief, Founding Editor-in-Chief of Cardiovascular uh, Jack Imaging and Associate Editor now of Jack. I'm almost finished. Uh, Dr. Larrakis is Professor of Medicine, Director of Non-Invasive Cardiology for Mount Sinai Heart and Director of Imaging for Structural and Valve Intervention. Mount Sinai Health System, uh, multimodality cardiac imaging, completed a year also in critical care at Brown University, which I did know. And last but certainly not least is our own Gennaro Justino, one of the cardiology fellows who's uh, actually spent almost six years now here at Mount Sinai, both as a medical resident as well as doing a postdoctoral fellowship in, in interventional cardiovascular research and clinical trials as well as working with uh, Dr. Jelen uh, at the Center for Population Health and Policy. The reason I took too much time in really introducing our faculty is to give everyone uh, an insight into the phenomenal uh, internationally renowned faculty that we have. We sometimes take that for granted and are jaded. Um, and I think it's such a unique opportunity to have uh, such a distinguished faculty as we do for these type of programs or for the routine programs that we have. I really don't want people to take it for granted. I want people to appreciate the fact that really through the forces and power that Dr. Fister has been able to keep this type of faculty together. Uh, and I think in this time of coronavirus uh, pandemic to see how well people work in, team, in teamwork, taking care of patients was amazing as well. Um, so I apologize for taking so much time. Let me um, give the podium over to Greg Stone. Thank you very much, Dr. Stone, for moderating today's conference. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Marty. Now, now I'm nervous about presenting to this panel. So let me share my screen. Um, so let's, let's see. go to the bottom, Greg. I know. It'll, there should be a green icon. Right. Okay, so you should be seeing a slide right now. Is everybody seeing that? You're good. Yeah, right. very good. So, so what I'm going to do is uh, um, the ischemia trial you heard about in great detail over two of these sessions from uh, uh, Gennaro Giustino. Um, it was my honor to serve as the co-principal investigator of this trial. So for the last 10 years, we were working incredibly hard to bring this home. And this is going to be fun. So all I'm going to do, I'm going to spend five minutes, maybe seven minutes, just giving you the highlights one more time so you can upload this into your claim. And then we're going to spend most of the time, I'm going to present you a series of four cases. And we're going to have some very interesting discussion, I'm sure, on how to apply the lessons from Ischemia and prior studies into the management of these patients. So let's see. Uh, I have no direct financial disclosures uh, for this presentation. Let's go back. Sorry. So, as you know, before ischemia, prior trials, most notably Courage and Barry 2D, did not show that revascularization and stable coronary disease prevented death or MI. In acute coronary syndromes, non-STEMI and STEMI, no doubt about it. But in stable CAD, it seemed as if there was symptom relief to some degree, which then kind of petered out over a couple years, and no difference in death or MI. But there were a lot of limitations to these studies. The patients were enrolled after angiography, so they were mostly low risk. The highest risk anatomical patients were excluded. Nobody, for the most part, enrolled 90% proximal LAD lesions uh, once they saw those um, anatomies. Patients also had only minimal to moderate ischemia. And there wasn't in both Barry 2D and Courage the use of contemporary stents, physiologic guidance, bilateral mammaries in the surgical patients, pharmacotherapy being um, optimal, et cetera. And again, there was a lot of data going into ischemia, and there still is, from very large uh, studies, actually up to 50, 70,000 patient registries, to suggest that with medical therapy, as the quantitative amount of ischemia increases, the rates of both cardiac death and myocardial infarction increase, and that once you have moderate to severe ischemia, about 10% or more of the ischemic myocardium, that revascularization might decrease that risk, although these were all from non-randomized studies. So in the ischemia trial, we took patients with stable ischemic heart disease, well, suspected ischemic heart disease, who had at least moderate ischemia on one of five different um, exercise type tests that were determined by the site, but also overread at a core laboratory. 
And these patients had to not have a recent acute coronary syndrome, had to not be in heart failure, did not have a reduced ejection fraction, less than 35%. And they also had to have um, either silent ischemia or only mild um, angina. So the belief would be that they would be able to be managed by an optimal medical regimen without the requirement for revascularization for symptom control. They then had a blinded CTA performed unless their creatinine clearance was very low. And that was to confirm that they actually did have coronary disease and that they didn't have left main disease. So no one thought it would be safe with these patients with extensive ischemia to, uh, if they had left main disease, to uh, be managed medically. Uh, so patients with uh, left main stenosis greater than 50% or non-obstructive coronary disease were then excluded. And the remaining 5,179 patients were then randomized to an invasive strategy of optimal medical therapy plus catheterization with revascularization with either PCI or surgery as feasible and optimal versus a conservative strategy of just medical therapy alone with catheterization reserved for refractory symptoms or acute coronary syndromes. So the patients were qualified again by five tests. 25% um, uh, of the time, it was an early positive, non-quantitative uh, treadmill exercise test, but early positive, um, uh, you know, within six mets with at least um, uh, one and a half millimeters of ST segment depression and multiple leads um, and reduced exercise tolerance. And the core labs read the um, inducible ischemia as being severe, uh, that is basically 20% quantitative to 15%, depending on the test, in, in more than half the patients, moderate in a third of the patients, and none are mild in 12% of the patients. These patients by CTA had extensive coronary disease. So this is the opposite of Courage and Berry 2D. Um, three quarters of the patients had multivessel disease, half had triple vessel disease. The LAD was involved in almost 90% of the patients, and 50% of the time, the proximal LAD was involved. So a lot of atherosclerosis. If you looked at the um, um, use of angiography and revascularization in the invasive group, almost all patients had an angiogram. Only 80% got revascularized, however, about three quarters PCI and one quarter bypass surgery. In the conservative arm, ultimately 28% of the patients, quote, crossed over and had an angiogram, and 23% at four years were revascularized. That compares to about 32% in the COURAGE trial. If you looked at the reason those angiograms were done, in about uh, two-thirds of the cases, they were for a real event, either, you know, unstable angina at rest or a uh, non-ST segment elevation MI or a STEMI, 8% were so-called protocol violations. And if you looked at the patients that were revascularized, again, about three quarters of them were revascularized preceded by a primary endpoint event. So we did a pretty good job keeping the unnecessary crossovers uh, down um, in the single digits. So the primary endpoint was a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, hospitalization, <laughs> angina, heart failure, or resuscitation, cardiac arrest. And there was no overall difference between the groups. You could see, though, that the curves overlapped. Early on, within the first six months, there were some greater incidence of periprocedural events in the invasive arm, so about 2% excess. By about two years, the, the curves caught up because there were fewer long-term events with the invasive strategy. So at the end of around four years, there were about 2% overall less events with the invasive strategy, which was overall borderline significant. But of course, you'd always rather have events um, uh, earlier, I'm sorry, later than earlier. So if you look at the event-free time overall, there was about a 10-day difference. The invasive arm had about 10 fewer days of, uh, of being event-free. You could see it as a wide confidence interval, and so it was not statistically significant. So overall, no real difference in these primary endpoint outcomes. And when we looked at multiple pre-specified subgroups, it didn't matter if there was single, double, or triple vessel disease, um, mild, moderate, or severe ischemia, proximal LED involvement, diabetes, really no um, a difference in the primary endpoint. Cardiovascular death or MI, the major secondary endpoint, drove most of the events, and you can see the curve looks identical. Um, again, a slight early hazard, but an overall slight late benefit, but no overall difference in the burden of disease. 
Most importantly, all cause mortality, the curves were absolutely superimposable at a median 3.2 year follow up. Um, in fact, if you did a Bayesian analysis, there's less than a 10% chance that there was a 10% or greater difference in mortality. So really no different. And you can see these are still low risk patients, stable coronary disease, 1.5% mortality per year. Myocardial infarction was interesting in that there was a slight hazard of MIs in the invasive arm, but then there clearly was a reduction in non-procedural MIs with the conservative arm. And this was because of a reduction both after PCI and cabbage. So this trial did establish that non-procedural MIs, the late MIs, are reduced by an invasive strategy, similar to what was seen in FAME2 and the uh, surgical arm of Barry 2 d And then finally, the flip side was quality of life. And the quality of life, as um, estimated by the um, Seattle <laughs> Questionnaire Summary Score, was clearly better in the invasive arm, although the differences were moderate, but it was um, at um, three months, 12 months, and 36 months, there was a durable reduction. And if you looked at the likelihood of being angina-free, there was a, a substantial difference in patients who were angina-free. So if you look, uh, and it depends on the amount of um, angina at baseline. So if you look at patients who are having weekly angina, for example, a Seattle angina questionnaire score of 50, at the end of three months, 45% of the invasive group was angina-free versus 15% of the conservative group a number needed to treat of three patients to make a patient angina free. And you can see even with monthly angina, there was a much greater reduction in any angina in the invasive arm. But if patients had no angina at baseline, then there was essentially no difference. So patients with silent ischemia did not benefit either in terms of hard mace or in angina, although those who were symptomatic with either weekly or monthly angina did, and these findings were durable over 36 months, which is different than we saw in Courage, likely because of the use of, of drug-eluting stents. So that's the basic ischemia trial. I'm not going to give you conclusions. I'm not going to give you take-home messages because that's where we're going to have discussion. Okay, so now I'm going to present four cases, okay, of perhaps increasing complexity, but they all have their own subtleties. So the first case is a 51-year-old woman who for the last three months has been noting daily episodes of non-radiating left-sided chest pain and tingling that usually last about 30 to 60 seconds at a time. But sometimes she says they last for five minutes, but sometimes only five seconds. The symptoms are usually exertional, that's when they come on, but sometimes she notes that they can occur after eating or sometimes even at rest. She has no associated symptoms like dyspnea, nausea, et cetera. And this pattern has been pretty stable for the last three months. Her cardiac risk factors, she's a current smoker. She smokes two packs per day. She's been doing that for 25 years. And she has a positive family history in that her father died of a heart attack at age 60. She's taking absolutely no relevant cardiac medications, no antiplatelet agents, nothing else. Um, on physical examination, uh, she looks healthy. Her blood pressure is 128 over 82. Her heart rate 70. Uh, pertinent labs, her LDL is 66 milligrams per deciliter and otherwise her labs are unremarkable. So my question for the panel, how do you further evaluate this patient? Do you reassure her that she likely has non-ischemic chest pain and you don't do any further evaluation? Do you start anti-anginal meds and do no other testing and see how she responds to anti-anginal meds? Do you give or do you do some sort of testing such as a regular treadmill test, some sort of quantitative ischemia assessment, stress echo, um, valium, technetium 99 MPI, PET, or MRI, or do you do a CTA? If you do a CTA, do you do a standalone, just CTA, or an FFR CT? Or would you say, let's just figure this out and do a coronary angiogram? Okay, so let me open it up to whoever would like to respond first. All right, I mean, I would say that even before the ischemia trial, this kind of patient, we know, either could have severe disease or could have normal. So my test before ischemia trial was CTA. Of course, now the FFR CT also done in those cases, but I, if I need to choose one before even giving any medicines and so, this test kind of patient uh, in my, you know, of course we'll hear other opinions and yours that I would, I was doing CTA before and now I'm doing more CTA in this kind of case. 
Okay, so you do a CT acemine. Would you do it with FFRCT in case there I mean, are significant stenosis? Yeah. yeah, you're right. What happened is now we are done at the Sinai and I'm sure many other centers that they automatically, uh, if it is a significant uh, borderline lesion means uh, 50 plus percent, they automatically do FFRCT. Well, you're right. The CTA should have the capability of FFR because that is what we want to know in this case. We have all packed 30 percent somewhere but whether it is a troublesome and causing the trouble for this case. So it has to be CTA plus minus FFR CT if you see 30, 40 plus percent lesion on the CT. So that is my opinion, of course, we have from others. So okay. Greg, uh, Greg, it's Rox Roxana. I think this is a great case. Um, we see a lot of women uh, with these types of symptoms for which we are not clear, but this patient has some true risk factors and i think obviously you really want to make sure that this is not coming this is not a cardiac and uh, cause and i agree with dr sharma and i don't know that the ischemia trial changes anything except for at first i'd want to basically dive a little bit more into how, how um functional she is how much exercise can she do is she able to walk and run and is she an active person and then I think the CTA helps a tremendous amount in not only risk stratifying her, but also in um, uh, really, really setting the rules and goals in getting her onto some form of medical therapy, depending on what we see on the CTA. I wouldn't necessarily, even if I did see a, a lesion run to a CTFFR, because I think the different it wouldn't make a difference if she doesn't have left vein disease and if these are just, um, symptoms that are coming and, and, and we can put her on medical management and see how she, how she does before jumping into a, um, a, a major um, so, intervention. Dr. Roxana, you can ask me and the panel can ask me further questions about these patients. So you wanted to know how active she is. So she does not get um, regular episode, uh, exercise. She's not active in that regard. She has a desk job. Um, but when, you know, she gets these mostly when she's walking um, uh, you know, across a room or vigorously when she's shopping, but sometimes also at rest. I, I would uh, well, well, uh, um, uh, I, I'm very concerned about this patient, particularly because has an early family history, which is a very important to me, um, uh, and she's a, she's a heavy smoker. Um, so um, clearly, the image test of choice is a CTA. No question about that in my mind. Uh, however, I would not send her in on no medication. Uh, this patient needs a CRP level and uh, uh, needs a, a pre-testing with a, a pre-treatment, I would say, or starting treatment uh, with, uh, with aspirin and statin, provided I'm sure the CRP will come up high. Uh, I, I mean, of course, I'm not talking about CTA performed the same day, but for most situations, CTA is about one to two weeks to get um, uh, pre authorization and, and perform. Okay, so her CRP is one, George. One? Is it a real value? I mean, uh, you know, a smoker with a, with a, with That's her CRP. Uh, the family history should have a CRP. That's so her CRP. It's one. That CRP is one. Value of CRP is one. I think, okay. I, I think that's what uh, about her LP little A? LP little A wasn't measured. Okay, that should be measured with a father who had a, a, a problem. That can run in families. Women at this sort of age, generally, even though they don't have terrible uh, lipid risk factors, often will have a high LP little A. Now, her LDL of uh, 66 by the Glegos trial, at that point, almost no one is making class whatsoever. So some people are, but... Uh, I think she has to have something else, an LP little a, always in this type of case you'd want to do. I think that C CTA is a good choice, but I think on this patient... Uh, and you've got an uh, echo. Do you have your phone? Also, up, please? Yeah. also may, may consider um, microvascular agina. I know she has uh, a family history and uh, risk factors for coronary artery disease. But also a uh, question here may be microvascular disease. So I think that the uh, so, geography is a good uh, test, but I think uh, if we want to get more objective evidence, 
what's going on with the patient may be perceptible. The patient may uh, a test with no radiation we can give us an idea about the exercise capacity, will give us an idea if there are any uh, ischemic ST changes, and also we'll be able to see about uh, regional wall motion abnormalities and then evidence of ischemia. And, uh, this can be very reassuring for the patient. If nothing of those. Uh, so then I'm sorry, you also wanted a stress, information. So stress echo? Yeah, stress echo. Uh, so is that your first test, or do you do a CTA first, stress echo first, I both? Mean, I, both? I, I mean, I, lo I love CTA, but uh, if I have to choose, I will choose stress echo. Stress I agree, echo. Valentin, I agree completely. This patient has symptoms of an exercise. And, and you know, uh, the fact of the matter is, this patient could have normal coronary arteries, as it has been seen in your ischemia trial, or could have some left main disease. And I think the question is, if the symptoms are exertional, why to move into a CTA as a first test? Okay, well, let me tell you what was done for this patient. So this patient did have a CTA as the first test. And if I can get, here's the results of the CTA. So, so what do you now recommend for this patient? So the CTA is normal, as was expected. So now uh, you will have to go into a stress test afterwards instead of yes. doing this before. Yes. The other question, Greg, I just want to bring up is, you know, at the major academic medical center at Mount Sinai, we have very good access to CTAs and and experienced people who can read them, but what do we tell the community cardiologist who may not be able to get access to that? Should they consider some of those other modalities as their first line in the real world? Well, I think probably the average person is also not an expert at uh, reading PET scans or technetium 99 cestamibis either. They rely a lot on the uh, reading of the expert radiographers or whoever is performing the test. This is Mary Ann McLaughlin. Dr. Stone, yeah, real world, the insurance companies will not pay for the CTA in my, in my office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, Pedro Moreno, I'm actually very, very supportive of Mary Ann comments. We yeah. see these patients every day and you have to do a stress test first. Otherwise you won't move on, but certainly for sensitivity and specificity of turkey CAD, CTA is the way to go. But in real life, it's just not approved. And getting the exercise information is crucial in this case. Hello, this is uh, Sandy Friedman. Has, has anyone ever seen tingling as a manifestation of angina before? Because I have not. <laughs> so what would you have done, Sandy, with that past medical history, with that history? You know, I mean, one of the um, advantages to just a private practice that you do the stress test yourself and sometimes you get a lot of knowledge just watching the patient and if she gets the pain to asking her where it is point to it you know what's the area of the pain etc and then you maybe even cut the whole thing off of the knees although there have been past studies that trying to reproduce patient symptoms on on a sort of a stress test has not been very reliable that may be so but if she has tingling over the area of the size right. of a quarter you know over her earlobe or something <laughs> So let's say she did that and she exercised nine minutes and she developed a little tingling uh, um, over the size of a quarter. Um, it was a uh, you know, left inframammary area and she did not have ischemic ST segment changes. Well, she's at risk of having atherosclerosis. The question is, is it true, true and related? Right. Well, I thought, I thought she already has atherosclerosis. The CTA is not normal coronary, it says non-obstructive CAD. So the patient with his family history and obstructive CAD and, and current smoker qualifies for uh, uh, rosuvastatin, uh, smoking cessation, and uh, uh, surveillance on uh, prediabetes and other aspects also. But, but you need to clarify if the patient has Inoka or not. So far, we don't have objective evidence of ischemia here. Yeah. I mean, and therefore, it's I'm crucial to do that. Uh, so at one, this point, at this that. point, Pedro, after you see the CTA, it changes. what test do you do? Yeah, then, then I'll go to any test that will allow me to quantify ischemia. And in the absence of um, a stress test, uh, either nuclear, if it's a good insurance and can, and can pay for it, or a stress echo. 
we, because the, the diagnosis of Inoka is very, very important in this case, and we don't have evidence of that. And, uh, what we, uh, what, and what way could we change our management if you have this elaborate imaging? Yeah, positive? very important, uh, uh, very important. I don't know. The, the issue where well, Roxana can expand a little bit on this, but non obstructive CAD in 55 year old pa patient is probably, you know, by the data of um, Steve Neeson, it's about, 50, it's about 80% of the population, uh, you know, non obstructive. So, you know, it's, it's something that it may be a bystander, maybe nothing to do with this. Quite different if you have Inoka, when you have a diagnosis of, a, of an entity that is evolving as an important uh, clinical uh, situation. Well, I, 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 well, contrary to this, uh, uh, this patient who is a heavy smoker and with early family history, I'm very concerned uh, that the test, uh, if it's maybe false negatives and all that, it maybe showed it doesn't have, falsely because these uh, tests are not so reliable also so I, I don't know i would risk it i would treat the patient with a presumptive diagnosis of a pretty strong actually diagnosis of inoka based on what we have right now no further testing but inoka is ischemia george and you don't have ischemia so you cannot label this patient as inoka i would say what treatment decision i would make now we can that's, it. that's another the tests and all that and you know i don't know who knows the false negativity of this test also so you know i'm very concerned i falsely misdiagnosed the patient due to a test inaccuracy so let me try uh, to summarize george can I, george Dangas, can i tell you something yes. if you had that you would have a stress test now you would then say i'm going to start taking medicines see if it works see if it doesn't if you had it I would do the t a stress test from the very beginning. I, wouldn't, I need to know, and, but I think when you say it doesn't make a change in the management, it makes a huge change in the mind of the patient to know what's going on here. So I think that's the key. I think you wanna diagnose whether the patient's symptoms are cardiac in origin. Um, you see that they're not due to epicardial coronary disease, but this kind of patient certainly has a higher incidence of microvascular disease or spasm or, or other causes of endothelial dysfunction, et cetera. And so, of course, why you're going to certainly drive her LDL down, perhaps you put her on a baby aspirin. That's another discussion for another day. Um, the question about using antianginal drugs to try to eliminate her symptoms and, and push one, two, three drugs. Um, and the type of drug you choose probably depends on whether or not she has some um, evidence of inducible ischemia. At least that's what I would think. Well, let's go on to the second case because I think they get increasingly interesting. And so I'm glad we had such great discussion on this case. Case number two, 66 year old man who for the last three months has been having episodes of non-radiating substernal chest pressure that occur only when walking upstairs or running and are relieved within 20 seconds with rest. They're occurring one to two times per week, no associated dyspnea or other symptomatology. He has um, long-standing hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he's a past smoker. He's currently taking um, um, 81 milligrams of aspirin a day, lisinopril and lodipine and atorvastatin. You see the doses here. His blood pressure is 134 over 82. His heart rate's 80. His LDL is 74 milligrams per deciliter. His resting EKG shows some minor nonspecific STT wave changes, and otherwise his physical exams and labs are non-contributory. So this is a different patient. How do you further evaluate this patient? Start antianginal meds. Say, this is angina. Pretty classic, very high pretest probability. I'm just going to put you on medications. No other testing. Would you do a treadmill test, some other assessment of quantitative ischemia, a CTA with or without FFRCT, or should this patient get cath? I will do, I will do the same. Uh, I will start with a uh, stress test. Uh, I will not do treadmill stress test because the patient has uh, non std wave changes, so I can be false uh, positive or negative. So I will do um, one of the most likely MPI uh, on this patient. Uh, with uh, exercise stress testing. And, and what are you looking for, Stam? Are you looking for mostly his functional capacity? Are you looking for the severity of ischemia or is there yes, any ischemia? Yes, I, I will look for uh, both for the severity of ischemia and also the exercise capacity. Um, 
So that's what I would do. I mean, my question is only, I don't know the person, if the person is big and the images of FECO uh, would not be good enough, but if, uh, I know that he looks, uh, that he, the echo will be good. I will go again first with stress echo. If it is big and the image is maybe not good, I will go with the, uh, preferably PET compared to SPECT. PET has more uh, um, uh, special resolution, is uh, less radiation because of uh, life of the rubidium. So that's what I will do. I will do qualitative ischemia assessment using uh, stress echo or PET, depending on how the patient looks, if he's big or... Okay, so let's, let's follow it through. You do one of those tests and there's a uh, 15% um, ischemia of the anterior wall. Yes. What do you do now? So if there are no um, major... No, there's no left main disease. Yes. You, you don't, and all you see is a, a, pro, you know, a, a good solid size anterior defect, um, uh, estimated about 15% of the yeah. left ventricular myocardium. It's a, it's so how, do, how do you know there's no left main disease? I, I don't. I, we've, oh, done us, we've done the stress test. Yeah, I, I will check. I mean, there are the parameters. But he didn't, he did not, you know, he exercised okay. He didn't have um, uh, transient ischemic dilatation of the ventricle. He yeah. didn't have hypotension, but... How much exercise? How much exercise on the, how many minutes? He, he, he did, uh, he exercised six minutes on a Bruce protocol. Six minutes and he stopped because of chest pain or? And he, he had chest, he had, did have chest pain and the doctor stopped him. He got his yeah. heart rate up to 85% uh, predicted maximum. Yes, so... ST I mean, depressions? No uh, ST depressions? He had one millimeter of ST depressions. Yeah, so this, uh, this uh, I mean, if he had chest pain, that, uh, that's, that was the reason that to terminate the test, then, uh, you know, I think uh, I will for sure increase his medications for, I mean, his LDL is good, you know, but... Uh, I may do a trial of uh, anti-adrenal medications and see if that will improve symptoms. And if he stays symptoms free based on the ischemia trial, he should do okay uh, compared to cons to ingress to uh, management. But if he on maximal anti-adrenal therapy and medical therapy, optimal medical therapy, he still has chest pain. This is a patient that you may be considered to do coronary angiography for better determination of uh, what's going on. This is Marty Goldman. I would attack him after that test. The purpose of doing the test is to see the extent and to confirm that it is coronary related. There's multiple risk factors. He didn't spend a lot of time on the treadmill. I think that the ischemia strategy is once you know the coronary anatomy. So I think it's pretty important as you move forward to make sure that you're not missing you know, significant proximal LAD or left main or multi-vessel disease because he didn't, he didn't stress enough to know um, that we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg and that the extent of the anatomical lesions are more significant. So I think the strategy is predicated once you know and confirm that he has extensive ischemic disease, um, your strategy subsequently is predicated on knowing what the anatomy is. I don't think yeah. that we have enough I would, information. I would also agree with that part, but uh, I have to say that this patient right off the bat from the first uh, visit qualifies for a beta blocker to be started. The heart rate is, uh, is, uh, is, is over, is, uh, uh, is, is up and um, has ischemic symptoms. <laughs> and we have to increase the uh, atovastatin to at least 40 so we can be at the high intensity level. And oh, uh, 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 I agree with this. I, I would say that, you know, 15% of ischemia is actually moderate ischemia as per the guidelines and as per the ischemia protocol. So, I mean, if we believe the ischemia trial, you know, if the patient had, I know he walks six minutes, if the stress was maximal, 85% of maximum predicted heart rate and above, we believe the ischemia trial, I think we should, uh, you know, conservative versus invasive management of this patient not have any uh, difference in outcome of MI uh, three years, uh, what was the follow-up of uh, three plus. So I think uh, as uh, antigenal medications and uh, aggressive medical therapy, I mean, the option here, otherwise we don't believe what ischemia says. 
And if the patient has chest pain, continues to have chest pain on maximal therapy, then I think we should do angiography. Because 15% no, of ischemia with no evidence of uh, TID, the lactone of uh, the ventricle, it's uh, not a high risk stress test, it's definitely not left main. Uh, so, no, but I can tell you the key is that what everybody talks about the ischemia trial and this is type in discussion. Everybody says, well, this is a ischemia patient. No, this is not a ischemia patient until you have ruled out CTA, left main disease. So what becomes, would you do, Samin? How would you evaluate this no, patient? I would, no, I think that was the right thing to do, added beta blocker. And then uh, the question was that if you were mild ischemia, which we know would not have been a type of uh, uh, the ischemia trial patient, but this particular case compared to the first one, I, you know, again, even before a post ischemia trial is still the same, give beta blocker and then do the stress test because we want to see whether it's still ischemic on the beta blocker. So question is, there are two things we do stress tests. Many times they stop all the medicine on the day of stress test on a CAD patient. Then I say, why? We want to see, is there any ischemic changes on the medical therapy? So I tell all my patients that when you're getting a stress test, they'll tell you stop your beta blocker. So no, take all of them, then do the stress test. If it becomes insignificant, mildly abnormal, don't worry. And if it is more, then you go further. So now what you have described it, I would say based on that, Beta blocker, of course, is the minimum this patient should be. Now you have to have two choices. Either you do a CTA or you do a coronary angiogram. I think in this particular case, I'll incline more to do a coronary angiogram because patient is symptomatic. We also, of course, we need to find out for patients what is uh, his otherwise activity, how active he has been. We know that he is symptomatic on exertion, but he really wants to play the sports or uh, do other more high vigorous activities. I definitely will go with one way, but in this case, CTA, you know, positive 15% uh, ischemia. Next test, uh, now let's say be a patient on beta blocker and become totally asymptomatic. At that time, do you want not to do a coronary angiogram? Again, it's a plus minus. To me, this case has to be still put into a ischemia format in the sense you still need to know the extent of coronary anatomy, which is five or 6% could be left main, but that you need to know in the 66 year old young guy. I think, I think Greg, this, this case is, is very interesting, very interesting how two brilliant minds, Lerakis and Sharma, has different approaches and highlights the importance of the interpretation of the ischemia trial, at least in my own view. And the ischemia, one thing is for the clinician, if you wanna have a diagnostic algorithm, and the other thing is you want to have a therapeutic algorithm. The ischemia trial, the experimental arm, has a pretty good diagnostic algorithm. It has CTA, it has a stress test, and, and, and actually the experimental arm when you know have angiography as well. So the ischemia trial doesn't help us for diagnostic algorithm. It helps us for therapeutic algorithm. As such, okay. a patient with large ischemia needs, needs, an, needs a diagnosis, an, an, an anatomy evaluation. Right. So I agree with Sharma. So let me tell you what, what his physician did. His physician said, well, I know this patient has atherosclerosis. He goes, he has absolutely typical angina. He's got multiple cardiac risk factors. Um, his uh, CCS angina class is class two. So he's not hugely active. He's only getting one to two episodes of angina per week. And the only anti-anginal he's on is m -loaded. So he goes, I don't need to do a stress test. I know he's got ischemia. I know he's got angina. So I'm going to follow the ischemia protocol. And now I just need to rule out uh, left main disease. So I'm going to get a CTA. And here's the CTA. His left coronary shows mild disease. There's no left um, disease at all. And this is his right coronary artery. So now, um, what do you recommend for this patient? The ischemia is anterior. Didn't you say that? The ischemia, no, no. This is, this, is, this is what actually happened with this patient. He did not have an MPI. Oh. The doctor said, I know this is angina. I know typical angina. I'm sure he's got ischemia. So why should I bother doing a diagnostic test? The ischemia <laughs> trial and says, let's it? rule out left main disease. And so he ruled out left main disease with a CTA. And here's the right coronary artery. This is the only significantly diseased vessel. What's the, CT, what's the FFR value associated with that? Uh, he didn't get a CTFFR. 
this I is a, this I severe. Presume they, I presume he started, the doctor started a beta blocker if he was so uh, convinced of the diagnosis. Uh, the doctor did start a beta blocker and also gave him sublingual nitroglycerin. He did not order a uh, CTA FFR. So how do you, okay. interpret, now, uh, now how do you case, interpret this CTA? Yeah. So, I mean, it looks like a quite significant right coronary, and this is now it become ischemia patient, right? Sal patient. So, so now he's an now, ischemia patient. Yeah. Now you decide based on symptoms, patient's choice, uh, what to do. And uh, so many times he's not, Dr. You what to Sharma, do. Dr. Sharma, he's not an ischemia patient. He did mm -hmm. not have an ischemia test. Exactly. I'm sorry, he is not an ischemia patient. Mm -hmm. So I think if had you had if you really wanted to understand what was going on with this patient, the physician should have ordered a, a stress test to assess for ischemia. And so, then so, it yeah. becomes that way. Now so, it's a backwards way. And if you're going to say, we, we know he doesn't have left main, and we do know, we don't know if he has ischemia or not. So despite that, you don't have to rush about anything. You're not going to, he's not going to drop dead, that's for sure, based on anything that we have ever seen. For the next year, he's totally stable. So you now have time to really work on his medical management and work with him on his quality of life and his angina frequency. Okay, so now it's the time for the ischemia test. That so let me, make, well, let, me make, let me comment on that because this is the interesting thing. So everyone got an ischemia because the sites thought they did have, you know, at least moderate ischemia. So your Rox is absolutely right. This patient would not have gotten an ischemia trial because they did not have such a test. So a lot of people have said after the ischemia trial, um, how does the ischemia trial apply to patients who don't have moderate or severe ischemia? So say this patient, Rox, had 5% ischemia or less than 5% ischemia, but has this you know, heavily diseased calcified right corner. You can see this here is an expansive, very severe stenosis in the mid right corner. Yeah. But now quantity, and he's got typical angina, okay? So quantitatively, now there's 5% ischemia or even 0% ischemia. Does that change your management in the post I, I think I will have a really big discussion with the patient. I would first and foremost let them know that yes, you have a major blockage in one of the arteries that, that we, we have already made that diagnosis. But this, if we do anything, we're not gonna save your life or reduce myocardial infarction, but we can help your symptoms. We can make you feel better, but we can also try medications to see if you are okay. feeling better. Those are the kinds of things that I think the ischemia trial is helping us make right. better contact and talk to the patient instead of sending them to the cath lab immediately, which is what was going on before. No, but I can tell you in the real life, just like what happened in Orbita trial, you tell a patient you have 80, 90 percent lesion, Patient will ask you to do the PCI. If not, he'll find another doctor to do the PCI. No, the, uh, what Dr. Sharma says is very important. First of all, we're asking a real-time question. Everybody said we've already started this patient on a beta blocker. So when we meet again, I presume we're meeting again, we're not doing that over the phone, with a patient, nobody mentions the very important question. How are you feeling since we started a beta blocker? And here's the answer. If the answer is I continue to have it's a, uh, chest pains and this and that, you already have a pathway that the already maximal medical therapy on lisinopril 10, amlodipine 10 plus beta blocker, elevated statin and aspirin. What more do you need for that? Um, uh, and if not, except if he's we'll a mountain climber and he can't do like biking, you know, those are the kinds of things that those are the. I mean, I'm answering the academic question, Dr. Sharma. I'm not answering whether or not somebody else okay. is going to be stupid enough to jump in and do a PCI. You're 100% right. But I think what I'm trying to say is what did ischemia show? The ischemia showed that there's no rush, that you could actually work. If there is ischemia here, you could actually work to enhance and improve uh, your medical management of the patient. And regardless of whether you do PCI or not, the medical management is absolutely frontline. And then working with this patient, if he's a biker, if he uh, wants to enter a competition and he now can't, 
these are the kinds of things that might push you to do a PCI. Okay, so I think this has been a great discussion. And I think the point is, is the points I wanted to get through is that, you know, I, I agree 100% with ROCS. Other than having that stress test up front, this is an ischemia patient. And I would argue that once you've got typical angina and once you see this severe lesion, I don't think you have to go any further. Um, it's very, very likely that this patient has um, ischemia. And I don't think the degree matters all that much. So I do believe you can have those discussions with the patient. And I think the ischemia trial supports either a course of medical therapy to try to get the patient um, uh, tolerable symptoms, asymptomatic, minimally symptomatic, uh, versus if the patient did say, look, now I've got angina, now I've got a severe stenosis, I know you're not going to prevent death or myocardial infarction overall, but I don't want any of this angina. Um, and I do want to be able to exercise more, then that would support going to the cath lab up front without even a further medical therapy. So let's hey, go on. The, other thing, the yeah. other, other thing you must do, and the lipids have not been talked about, that 74 L still making plaques, and that's no good. He yes. has to get down to at least an LDL under 60, where in the Gregor trial, no Absolutely. one. Now, how do you get from 74 down to 59, for example? Well, that's, you don't just double the torvastatin. Every doubling of the statin gives only 6% drop in the LDL, which would be 5 milligrams per deciliter. So you have to then go to azetamide. Azetamide gives you a 20%. So all, this is a particularly good case for showing, and this is how azetamide got approved. It took people with LDLs like this, got them down to uh, in the 59 range, and at that point they got a reduction in coronary events. So that has to be done. Okay. As well as all the other complex things you all are talking about. Right. And in addition, well, let's, uh, I've got two more cases, guys, and they get, I think, increasingly interesting. So here's case number three. This is a 74-year-old man who said he had a heart attack on the bottom of his heart 10 years ago. He had an angiogram at that time, and he was told that he had two blocked arteries, but that his heart overall was working well. He was actually recommended to have an angioplasty, but he refused. He's very physically active. He works in his yard on a daily basis. For the last 10 years, he's had mild arm tingling when working vigorously, for example, pushing a lawnmower uphill or hammering. These symptoms usually resolve within 15 seconds with rest. If they do last longer, which they do occasionally, he takes a sublingual nitroglycerin, which then relieves his arm pain. For the last year, his symptoms have been occurring somewhat more frequently, and they're more easily provoked, but they do not occur with mild activities like walking. He's now moved to New York City from Nebraska, and his new internist just referred him for a cardiology evaluation. So his cardiac risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a past smoking history. You can see he's on aspirin, lisinopril, atenolol, amlodipine, atorvastatin, 80 milligrams, and sublingual nitroglycerin, PRN. His blood pressure is 130 over 78, heart rate 66. His LDL is 110. He has small inferior Q waves, um, but they're pathologic Q waves. Uh, otherwise, his uh, uh, labs and physical exam are unremarkable. So how do you want to further evaluate this patient? Well, the interesting part about this patient is that has a diagnosis and is already on maximal medical therapy. Um, so uh, unfortunately, his LDL is out of control. So on, on visit number one, you have to follow the pathway of Zedia and refer the patient for a, a treatment with PCSK9. Um, inhibitors, uh, uh, just to uh, finish that part. And I would evaluate this patient with a, a, a resting echo and a, a nuclear stress test. Okay, I would say that his PL is 110. You're trying to get it down to 60 and below. In that case, to get at a 50% reduction, you just go straight to a PCSK9, which will give you a 50% and get him down to 55. And that would be in terms of the long-term prevention. You must do that. I, I agree with, uh, with this. I will start. Uh, we know he has coronary disease. Uh, I think uh, I will begin with uh, ischemic, quantitative ischemic evaluation to get an idea about where the ischemia is in case he has uh, most likely multi-vessel coronary artery disease. 
and to know that uh, and if the symptoms persist, then to go with uh, coronary angiography, knowing ahead of time where the ischemia is and which vessel to open up uh, the vessel disease. Yeah, I, I fully agree with George. I think it's exactly what I will do in the, in the clinic. But thinking twice, what this guy needs is an angiogram. I mean, if we, didn't, if we wouldn't be you know, tied up with all these regulations, this guy has refractory angina to maximum medical therapy, has a previous MI, he's, at high, he's a high risk patient. So, you know, in, in, in the early life, we do exactly what he says. We need to know the EF and we need to document ischemia and just to put him on the table. But what he needs is an angiogram. Okay, well, let me meet you halfway, Pedro. You're a uh, good cardiologist. And guess what? They keep records in Nebraska. So you called his doctors in Nebraska and you asked them to send you his angiogram from 10 years ago. And they did. And here's his angiogram from 10 years ago. His um, obtuse, second obtuse marginal was occluded. His right coronary was normal. His left ventricular ejection fraction was 65% with mid inferior wall hypokinesis. And this is his LAD 10 years ago. Okay. So now what would you recommend? Does this change anything? Yeah, I think he needs the angiogram. Um, I mean, the stress test is not going to change for me. He, you already know he has a severe obstructive multifocal, you know, segmental LAD that is actually a one zero zero bifurcation proximal to the first set of perforator. The RCA has Q waves, so I have to see the RCA, the inferior wall. And he's probably going to be a very good case to discuss between optimal revascularization, either percutaneously hybrid or surgical. Yeah, I, I agree. If if you know that, if you have seen this uh, cut from before, I will uh, avoid the stress test, go straight for cut. And this one, uh, my opinion, FFR guided LED diagonal intervention. Um, can I say something? Uh, this is Sandy Friedman. Uh, this is the, the second tingling case that you've brought to us. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to establish myself as the tingling expert at Mount Sinai. So, at any event, if I had someone who had tingling in his arm pushing a lawnmower up the hill, I would think of a shoulder impingement syndrome or something. So this might have taken me down the tubes until the symptoms went away with nitroglycerin. That's all, all right. Possible. What was done, uh, Greg, on this case? What did they do? Okay, so um, this patient, you know, applying the ischemia trial, you know this patient has coronary disease, the ejection fraction, the, the, an echo was done, and the echo left ventricular ejection fraction was 60% with only mid, you know, mild inferior wall hypokinesis. Um, and so the doctor thought to himself, this patient does have coronary artery disease, and whether or not the symptoms are ischemic, he said to himself he wasn't 100% sure, but they were relieved by nitroglycerin. They seem to be increasing in frequency somewhat. So he talked to the patient about his options. Uh, the patient did not want to get a CT scan. The left main was normal 10 years ago. And so they treated this patient medically with no other testing. Good. Okay, last case. Now, this case is perhaps the most interesting, uh, and I'm going to give you, I will tell you, the tests that are done, I'm going to give you three different options. I'm going to show you three different test results, which may change your opinion. So this is a 58-year-old man without any prior angina or without known coronary disease, who six months ago developed a new onset of substernal chest pain, rating to his left arm when he climbed stairs, sometimes with associated dyspnea resolves within 30 seconds when he rests. He hasn't told anyone about this chest discomfort, and his chest pain's been occurring two to three times per week, but has been stable for the last six months in all aspects. His wife finally found out and forced his confession to his doctors. The patient's father had a stroke during the angiogram, so he does not want an angiogram. His cardiac risk factors, his longstanding diabetes and hypertension, he has past medical history of atrial fibrillation. He takes insulin, warfarin, hydrochlorothiazide, and lisinopril. His blood pressure is 142 over 88. His heart rate is 70. His LDL is 136 milligrams per deciliter. His hemoglobin A1C is 7.8%, otherwise negative. Okay, so how do you want to evaluate this patient? Well, this patient is a disaster. He's <laughs> a, a very high LDL. 
and he's got no studying for unknown reason, despite <laughs> all these problems and despite the diabetes. So patient is to go on rosuvastatin 40 milligrams and, and Zedia right away on presentation. Anything else to be discussed. And if the patient doesn't want an angiogram, the patient will go for a CTA in my idea. So Greg, the one thing you guys did on ischemia that I think the entire community is extremely thankful for is your, you've given all of all physicians a chance and time to manage patients medically to the best possible way on every single one of those risk factors. And I think that is the biggest message that ischemia has given us. And then making very important individualized um, uh, decisions once we have the medical management and, and we heard from Dr. Smith of how aggressive we need to be for a durable result down the line, regardless of what the revascularization is, for us to really, really work on this man's blood pressure and, and uh, hemoglobin A1C. And there's so much to do here. This is a patient who should absolutely not come to the cath lab and should absolutely get their med medical management in, in order before we even think about any other test. But we obviously know he has coronary disease, and we certainly uh, believe wholeheartedly that his medical management is out of whack. So revascularization will not help him in any way unless we get that first part fixed. So ischemia helps us in that way, gives us time. So thank you for that. And, and I agree, Roxana. Um, again, remember in ischemia, we did rule out left main disease and that perhaps is a consideration in this patient, especially with dyspnea on exertion. But I I do also want to mention that one of our things that we were relatively disappointed in ischemia was despite having a lot of free medications that we could give the patients and constant phone follow-ups, et cetera, we were only to, able to get optimal risk factor control in 40% of the patients, similar in both arms. But we started at baseline, it was about 20% had optimal risk factor control. And after seven years of ischemia, we only were able to increase that to 40%. So it's difficult. To, you know, even with free medications and all that um, uh, close follow-up, probably more so than in the real world, to really get people as controlled as you would like. But let's get to the questions, though. What do you want to do to evaluate this patient's uh, um, uh, coronary disease? Um, do you want to do a treadmill test? Do you want to uh, assess quantitatively for the severity of ischemia, CTA, with or without FFRCT? Or do you want to insist, tell this patient, Look, strokes extremely rare. Your father was unfortunately very unlucky. You just need a coronary angiogram. This case, CTA plus minor with FFR guidance if needed. Yeah, the question is, would you do that after you started coring or before? No, uh, you, no you started. You started, George. All the all uh, those things. No, those you need therapy. to do in your visit, your clinic visit. You started beta blocker. In case yeah. you started your Crestor and all those and ZTA and so. Right. And right. then it's scheduled CTA. I think contrary to the other cases, here the clinician has the opportunity to improve survival. If, his, if uh, pre vessel disease or extensive CAD is documented, both from Barry 2D, which um, surgical arm had a mortality of 10% absolute reduction from 30% to 20% or something like that, as well as the, um, the, 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 yeah. the trial, uh, you know, the diabetic trial from here. So. The key here is um, we can change uh, the natural history of the disease with revascularization if the case is in the, if, if the anatomy allows us to do. And therefore, the angiogram, I think, is the way to go because no surgeon will operate without an angiogram. I mean, CTA with multivessel, calcific, left main disease. So which anatomy, which anatomy uh, Pedro, changes the prognosis? Remember, in the ischemia trial, Three quarters of the patients had multivessel disease. Fifty percent had triple vessel disease. Uh, proximal LED involvement was half the patients. There was absolutely no difference in survival. So but you you haven't reported your diabetic subgroup. Oh, we did. We did. There was absolutely no difference with or without diabetes. That was a, one of the pre-specified subgroups. It's in the but, main group. And the the, vol, the 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 power of the sample is good enough for that? No. Uh, no. Of course not. For any subgroup, the power is not good enough, but we certainly, so you've got to take 
take that into account. But we didn't see any signal. No, I mean, in this case, I, no, that, no, let, no, no I would say that I said CT in this case just because of the patient bias. You need to convince. You need another test in between. So basically, as Greg asked, what will be the CAD which will change the prognosis? It will be the left main. Yeah, I think that this in this patient as well, you know, he has a lot of pre preconceived notions about any invasive test. Yeah. And so he needs to be slowly backed into understanding that he has coronary disease and will likely need an intervention. The one thing that about the ischemia trial, which I think was, you know, adds a lot to the literature and, and our understanding of these patients with multivessel disease is that despite having so many patients with proxima LAD and multivessel disease, very only 25% of the patients that had an intervention in the invasive group had cabbage. That's correct. Yep. And we haven't reported yet the uh, detailed extent of angiographic uh, coronary disease in relation to PCI versus cabbage and the completeness of revascularization and its impact. And we'll do that, uh, we believe, in September of this year. I All right, so let free, me. Free let me still, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go. Uh, okay, so um, Greg, just to tell you, the, five, you have five more minutes. Right. Yeah, so that's what I want to show you some of the conclusions. Yeah, too. If we so, let's conclude. So his doctor decided to do a CTA, just like Dr. Sharma suggested. So now I'm going to show you three different possible CTA results. And now I want you to tell me, based on this CTA, what you're going to recommend to the patient or what kind of discussion you're going to have with the patient. So here's the first CTA result. Who would like to interpret this? Stam. I can never go to Help us, Stam. So he has uh, significant right coronary disease. Uh, yeah. He has uh, uh, the left, uh, yeah, that the left main looks okay. Prox LAD. Significant uh, LAD disease. I mean, he has. Three vessel disease. Uh, I mean, the, the left main looks okay, but he has all the other vessels are significant yeah. disease. So there's some disease, you know, yeah. in the in the proximal yeah. LAD. Left main's okay, but you can see here it, it's the left coronary disease is not severe. There appears to be a severe right coronary stenosis. Okay, so now what do you tell this patient? Do you say you should have an angiogram and have this fixed? We can try medical therapy first. It's kind of your option. What do you want to tell the patient? I mean, based, based on the ischemia trial, he has no left main disease. I will maximize his uh, medical therapy. And he used to have chest pain, or his chest pain increases in frequency. Then proceed with uh, Medical therapy is OK in this case right now. Let's go to another CT scenario. This is yeah, because we have what if the patient tells you, I don't want to have chest pain? I, I you know, yeah. I don't like this. Yeah, yeah, then I will go ahead and uh, do the cardiac cut. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Here's scenario number two. All right. Okay, Stan, tell us what this one shows. So, this, the LAD, I mean, he has a lot of calcium proximal, so I cannot tell if it's significant because the calcium obstruct, I mean, obscures the image. He may have uh, proximal LAD. He has no significant uh, left circumflex. I mean, no obstructive disease. And the right coronary also is looks like non-obstructive, but the proximal LAD, and actually the middle LAD, the middle LAD is severely stenotic. It's basically, yeah. yeah. So he has uh, proximal LAD disease, severe disease. Also. Maybe some disease in the... Non-obstructive, yeah. Okay. okay, so now, do you, does this change this one compared to the prior CT? Do you have a different discussion with this uh, diabetic patient or no? Same discussion, different discussion? It's the same because the left main is okay, so... Uh, well, this is because of the ischemia trial, but with, with Freedom and, and George published beautifully the subgroup of insulin-dependent diabetics, the, this guy needs revascularization. I, I don't know why... Um, well, you didn't we, have a control debate. group in Freedom. You didn't have a medical therapy control group, did you? No, no medical therapy control, but medical therapy has never been shown to be better than revascularization. It's always a tie. 
and yeah, this patient is a it depends on he on this patient's aversion to cardiac cath because of his father, the patient father's stroke. Uh, either gonna get a radial cath or is gonna go for a mini by for a bypass lima to a lady. So you are you saying you would do a, a lima to LAD, George, without a cath? Well, if the patient is uh, is freaked out because the father had a bypass, had a had a stroke, um, you know that happens. But the CTA is high quality. You can do Not a bad choice. <laughs> but only thing is, is the sir, have we ruled out the disease in the circumflex? That's the question. Agreed. Uh, we we can think right. about that later if the patient has more problems. If you can convince him to have a cat, forget about the surgery. You know. Right. So one, one, one certainly easy thing to do here would be to get an FFRCT. And that FFRCT has been trained to do pretty well in calcified lesions. It's been used machine learning to become beyond that. So I think you would understand whether this right coronary end or circ was ischemic with an FFRCT. So would that change your opinion? Let's say he had single vessel versus double vessel versus triple vessel ischemia. Would that change your um, opinion as to how strongly to recommend, say, he's got to be revascularized? Uh, it's got to be revascularized anyhow. The question is how and how the patient would accept it. So the ischemia trial would say that there's no difference in mortality with revascularizing this patient versus not. That's just the ischemia trial. But I don't know how many patients with triple vessel disease and diabetes did we have? That's, of course... Always a limit. I don't know that any patient will refer the, uh, uh, this patient for inclusion in ischemia trial with this anatomy. Nobody would. No, no, George, remember, the CTA is only after you're randomized. Yeah, it was the CTA is blinded. It's before you randomize, but it's blinded. This patient is definitely in the ischemia trial, yeah. as long as he had a positive um, ischemic test. He's definitely in the ischemia. We definitely had patients like this in ischemia. There were a lot of them. The, this I mean, I, patient, due to balanced ischemia, is never going to have moderate to severe ischemic scan. So that patient is out of the ischemia trial. I think, I think, I think the, the only way the ischemia trial to be applied clinically uh, and routinely is to not know the anatomy, you know, because uh, uh, as soon as you know the anatomy, you know, you, you have to act. I mean, right. Nobody will leave uh, this LAD like this, you know. I mean, even if you know the ischemia trial results, so I think that's why I would believe the ischemia trial would stick with the, the expression, the functional testing. Uh, otherwise, as the previous case also, you know, if you see uh, a severe disease like the mid right coronary artery in the previous case, I mean, you cannot leave that like that, you know, even if you know. I Stem, Stem, I don't think that's true. Eric Stern here. Uh, I, I would point out the ischemia trial in, ischemia, in stable disease gives us license to see how the patient feels. We are not rushed. At least that's my view of it. Yeah, that's a good thing. Well, I would agree with that, Eric. The, the, you know, there was no change in the mortality curve. It was low in, in all patient groups, although it is higher in some groups than the but, other, of course. But we had but, no subgroup where we could see a difference in survival with revascularization. And I will tell you, um, contrary to what George was saying, there were hundreds, if not a thousand patients in ischemia whose CTs looked like this. It's the worst Greg, coronary disease I've ever seen in a trial. Tell, tell us a little bit about the results of the ischemia trial regard, you know, in, according to the anatomy. Three vessels did different but from two vessels. It doesn't make so, a difference, right? I, because they it, already showed that data. So, they right. said so that the, the difference, extent didn't matter. So it, it did matter in terms of the overall prognosis. The MACE rates and CV death and MI rates were higher with three vessel disease compared to two vessel compared to one. But the relative change with the invasive approach versus the conservative right. approach was absolutely unchanged. That's what I said. That's what I was saying. You're right, Greg. Of course, they're going to have a higher MACE, but it doesn't matter what you do. The, the relative uh, delta between... Uh, it, it is no di there's no difference whether you treat them invasively or non-invasively. All right, so let me show you, one more. just yes, to conclude, let me show you the third like option. Here's the third CT scan. Stan? Yes, uh, I mean, the proximal right coronary, we cannot see well. Also, the distal, you need more images to see if it's occluded or uh, for the right. 
There is uh, the left circumflex looks uh, occluded. M is occluded in the beginning. F main most likely is a calcified plaque, but most likely no more than 50%. LAD also not obstructive, looks like, but with coronary plaque. So, circumflex OM1, OM2 completely occluded. And RCA middle, uh, most likely significant lesion. So, at least two vessel coronary disease with the open left main. Yeah, and the CTO, you think, of the circumflex? Yes. I mean, totally occluded, yeah, totally occluded. Yeah, so it looks like both the OM1 and OM2 either yeah. are subtotally or totally occluded. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't tell you the severity of that plaque because it's, uh, you know, yeah, it's yeah, I agree. I mean, but... solid calcium, the whole thing. And yet, right. yes, the left main has a 50% calcified plaque. Yeah. That's how Greg, this is. Greg, this is Sandy Freeman. You know, the amount of exercise you can do on a treadmill is a very strong prognostic indicator for events. So would your thinking be changed if any of these patients, let's say, couldn't do more than uh, three METs versus eight METs on the treadmill? So, so great question. So we actually told people that in general, if they had, you know, moderate or severe ischemia, but if they had transient ischemic dilatation or if they developed hypotension, or if they were absolutely markedly limited, such that there was a high non-invasive suspicion of either left main disease or such severe coronary disease that that might benefit from revascularization that we didn't want them in ischemia. So we don't have a, a screening registry, unfortunately, as to how often that occurred, but for the most part, those patients are not in this trial. Greg, uh, I, can, this is Michael Robbins. Can I, I, I just had a question. I noticed in ischemia, uh, the CAD, the presence of single vessel or double vessel or triple vessel, was based on a 50% number. Correct. And we all kind of, like, if Samin had called us from the cath lab about a patient, said, oh, he has a 50% lesion, nobody would have really revascularized that. If you looked at the numbers based on a number that we would have uh, addressed, you know, like a 70% lesion, does that change the outcomes at all? No, but only for the left main. Uh, Mike, uh, the left main, even 50%, we count significant by every No, cent. the left main, I understand. But if you, I, I actually have the paper up. It says CAD severity based on 50% stenosis, single vessel, two vessel, or three vessel. So when we start talking about left mains, are we talking about a 50, uh, I mean, left, left mains, LADs or, or whatever, are we talking about a 50% lesion? Would that change if we talked about a 70 or an 80% lesion? You so can always the, FFR. The CTAs, as you know, really don't have that resolution. So the way that the, the CTA core lab was ran, was run by um, uh, uh, Jim Min, and basically they categorized it as 50 to 75%, 75% to 95%, and greater than 95%. We'll be presenting a, the detail of the patients who had an invasive approach. We'll be presenting the detailed angiographic findings, which will, with QCA, go down to a tenth of a millimeter, We'll give you every possible diameter stenosis, but that'll be later this year. Yeah, because I mean, when we've been doing it with this with the FFRs, if they're positive or negative with the CT FFR, that kind of has been one of the ways that we've discriminated on which we needed to revascularize prior to ischemia. And I wonder how that impacted. We're, so, we're, up, against, we're up against a hard stop, so we're going to need for you to summarize, and we can. Do you have the FFR result of this one, Greg? Uh, no, this day did not order a CTFFR. So let, let, me, let me stop. And what I've tried to do is uh, show you the ischemia results. You know, you look at them and they seem fairly straightforward. Uh, and I think they've added a tremendous amount to our knowledge base on which to make these decisions. But then when you get to real world patients, it's not always so straightforward. And there are issues, as was said before, of using different kinds of tests to diagnose whether or not a clinical syndrome is consistent with ischemic heart disease versus to guide therapy. Uh, and of course, the ischemia trial is only one trial. It doesn't negate the last 40 years of our understanding of the importance of the number of disease vessels, diabetes, left ventricular function, et cetera. And of course, ischemia excluded um, patients with ACS, with heart failure, low LVEFs, and patients with substantial angina that were gonna need revascularization. So a lot of people have said that one of the most interesting things after ischemia is that it's basically said we don't need routine stress testing anymore, with or without ischemia um, evaluation, that all we really need is a CT. 
perhaps with a CTFFR. And I can tell you there are a lot of proponents that believe that, but there are a lot of people who strongly believe there's still a tremendous value to putting somebody on a, on a treadmill, seeing how far they can exercise, what happens hemodynamically, uh, then as well as quantitatively assessing uh, the extent of ischemia in terms of both diagnosis and therapeutic prognostication. So we don't have one size fits all yet, and I hope that uh, this session has been kind of food for thought as you see these complicated patients. Greg, thank you very much. Greg, this was great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll thank definitely you. have a second session. Is Robin Verghese still there? Robin? Yeah, I'm here. Can you just give a surgical surgeon's perspective, but also an epidemiologist and uh, a thinking man medical doctor, what your perspective is on ischemia trial? Yeah, I think it added uh, a lot to the literature and, and our understanding of these patients with, you know, complex coronary disease um, with symptoms. And it tells us that we have time as everybody's saying, we don't need to rush into interventions. We have time to get patients on maximal medical therapy. We're only out to, you know, the mean follow-up was three years. And so we do have time, but the curves seem like they start to separate, um, maybe not for mortality, but for major, for MACE and, and for sure angina, we know. Um, from the revascularization standpoint in the invasive patients, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of these patients, the majority of them had multivessel disease, proximal LED in 50%, but only 25% of patients had a coronary bypass grafting surgery. So I don't know how much we can um, uh, ascertain uh, with respect to medical therapy versus coronary bypass grafting from this trial. Um, it seems more related to the invasive strategy being PCI versus medical therapy. Well, Greg, we're going to get more about that in September, correct? Yes, you'll definitely hear more about that. There'll be, again, PCI and surgery weren't randomized to each other in this trial. That wasn't the purpose. Um, but whether or not the, um, I'd say um, surgery was appropriately used in patients with this complex coronary disease, I think we need to see more details of how severe the stenoses were and uh, how many of them were ischemic. The last thing I'll just show you is this slide that, you know, Antman and, and Braunwald wrote the editorial from Ischemia, and they found support for both a conservative and an invasive approach. Um, the support for the initial conservative approach is that it didn't seem like there was a rush, and patients who had an acceptable um, level of angina could be treated with an initial conservative strategy. In contrast, they also found support for an initial invasive approach and which more effectively relieve symptoms, especially those with frequent episodes, and that was reasonable at any point in time. And that was, I think, an important um, uh, additional clause they added, because of course, as you know from AUC criteria, you basically had to fail at least two different drugs before it would be reasonable to revascularize somebody with stable coronary disease. But now I think with the clear demonstration that symptom relief was better, that uh, you don't have to go through that severe course of uh, antianginals. You can offer revascularization earlier if that is consistent with the goals of the patient. So I'll stop there. I had some interesting algorithms as to how we might, uh, if we're out of time, Marty, as to how we might bring in, therefore, stress testing and echoes um, uh, and CTs in this modern era. But if we're out of time, we can stop. We'll definitely have another session. Thank everyone very much. All of our participants, commentators, Greg, thank you very much for preparing it. And we'll definitely come back at part two. Have a great day. Thank you. All right.